So we're back today, and I'm here with Sean Sullivan again to discuss the concept of free will, which we were wrestling with in a previous conversation as we had been discussing the debate between Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris, which didn't focus on, on the free will, but it seemed like a really good topic. So we're going to go and discuss that a bit further today. And I'm not a philosopher, so I'm speaking in kind of just general terms about the contrast between the two ideas of free will. Uh, and one is roughly determinist, but there's different versions of determinism, which generally says that free will is mainly illusory or an illusion. And uh, libertarian or compatibilist views, which focus more on th that the free will is a reality that that is the basis for other realities. And this that's a really short introduction, but uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and so, how let, let me before we jump into the actual discussion, how how was your summer going, Sean? There, with any any uh. Anything new in your world? Well, I appreciate being brought back on the podcast, Paul. Uh, I'm a little bit up in the air about what my uh, plans are. The the jury's still out on on that, so I'm on uh, I'm on God's good humor at the moment. Very good. That's that's similar to me. Like you know, I'm moving ahead with my work, but I, I really need to give it some time and let things develop but but here we are so let's let's jump into the actual discussion and let me just throw out my first idea here which is that I I guess I'm trying to defend the idea that is it a libertarian or a compatibilist view I'm not sure which you would consider it but I would argue that my intuition that I'm making free choices at given moments in my day and in my life are reflecting of, of a reality, a, re a really free choice. And that's not to say that I'm always, I have all kinds of limitations and things that have conditioned me and my history and my biology and the language that I'm using even, which kind of, um, conditions what I'm even able to think. At the same time, I'm able to think outside the box, so to speak. I'm able, I'm even able to come up with new words. When there's like a word, there's not a word available for the thought that I'm coming up with. I believe that I can, and sometimes I do, I invent a new word to to kind of reflect this this thing that I believe that I'm freely grappling with or or, or inching my way towards. So let me let me see how 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 does that strike you as a as a as an opening thought? Sure. Well, maybe I can um maybe I can outline the landscape of conversation had on the will a little bit. There are three major models that are usually discussed in in this uh, on this matter. There's, as you mentioned, Paul, there's the libertarian view, which is not to be confused with the uh, political philosophy uh, of libertarianism, but rather uh, is, is um, mean, means is a, is a model of will that posits that people have the capacity to choose to do otherwise. Uh, which are sort of the the magic words as a, a professor at Rice University and I, I were discussing. Um, and, and so the, the, the idea being that, that the, 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 the dominoes don't just fall as, as they will, but, but rather that people author into existence um, behavior that, 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 that alters the, the traject, tra trajectory of, of occurrences in the world. Then there's the de, um, de, determinist paradigm, which 
does in fact argue that the dominoes just fall as they they are uh, and that that people do not have the capacity to choose to do otherwise that the that that uh, that, that everything including this conversation you and i are having down to the words that i'm using down to the words that i stumble over down to the the pauses uh that that i that i take as i'm gathering my thoughts are are all uh predetermined to happen and, and i'm not authoring into this conversation um uh, anything that 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 wasn't predetermined to, to occur and then the, there is the compatibilist uh paradigm which argues that even if we are to be uh that that, that determinism and and uh, uh the libertarian model of, of the will which we just mainly in in, in 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 colloquial speak we mainly just call that uh the concept of free will is usually what people mean by that when they invoke the, the idea of free will the, the compatibilist view is, uh, is takes the position that even though we are determined our actions are still free and the model that I'm most familiar with, and the model that I've 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 uh, I've, I've, I've studied up on, in terms of being able to uh, to to discuss and to uh, uh, argue against, is, is a is is the compatibilist view that if we are to say, if we are to argue that that conduct is the is is the product of a particular state of psychophysiology. Uh, put simply, if 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 mind if if, if mind and, and brain are just two sides of um of the same coin, if if behavior if experience is is whether or not our our neuroscience has come up to the to to the has has evolved and advanced enough to be able to find whatever the particular physiological signature is that gives rise to that particular behavior or that particular uh, state of mind that 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 it nonetheless does have a a a, a physiological uh, signature which is to say a, a particular brain state um so so, so that's that the, the, the compatibilist world view uh, argues that well if we are to identify self with the totality of the the anatomy or at least this is a model of of the um, of the the compatibilist paradigm if we are to identify self with the totality of of of, of self which in the case of the the evolving neuroscience uh, gives us every reason to believe is 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 our you know that, that we are immutable to our bodies it's not as if um in other words as as harris you know puts it uh if you bump your head you might forget your name uh if you bump if you bump your head in a certain way your heart might stop uh, uh it, but but somehow if the whole brain is destroyed if the whole psychophysiology or physiology is destroyed the the, the some nonetheless still believe that that somehow the mind remains intact um, and then uh you know if you believe in a soul and then and then floats off but you know as, as harris points out that it, it doesn't quite follow uh, logically speaking um if 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 we can observe that uh, somebody can have diminished speech capacity if they bump one part of their brain or they can die if they bump another part of their brain or they can go blind if they dump another or if they bump a another part but somehow the whole thing is destroy destroy uh, some you know so it, in the, the 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 from a non-dualistic perspective uh, that is really one way to argue for the compatibilist um, uh, view um, so, so again, just to summarize, we have the libertarian view, characterized by those magical words, as a, a professor here at Rice uh, put it to me, the capacity to choose to do otherwise. Then there's the determinist paradigm, the dominoes just fall as they will. And then the, um, and then the, the compatibilist 
worldview, which is, well, if we identify self with one of those dominoes, we are freely falling. And so even though we're, we, our, our lives are determined, we still freely um, control them. So hope, I hope that that sort of gave it an, an overview. Um, I, I will be defending um, the determinist uh, paradigm because it is uh, overwhelmingly, I, I, in my estimate, the, 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 the only uh, compelling or reasonable, rational uh, worldview. So I hope that gave us an okay intro. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for for laying that out very clearly and um, and 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 stating your position. And I I'm not sure if I would because given those three viewpoints, I'm not sure if I would. I'm going to be different from you. I'm not sure if I'm going to be more the libertarian viewpoint or the compatibilist viewpoint. I suspect I would be more within the compatibilist framework because I would agree that many things are determined um but I would still say that free will still exists and I guess a couple of points that I would make briefly because there's a lot of points that I could make one is that I think when I have an intuition it's not always true and and and, and, and in fact, Many times my intuitions are false. That said, intuitions are crucial to knowledge as a whole. And, and it seems to me that the, the determinist viewpoint, the viewpoint that you're pr proposing, doesn't give enough credence to intuition. And it tends to think that, oh, intuition has zero, qual zero input because everything's, and the only things that, that are real are the things which you can measure with a medical or scientific instrument. And so something that's an immaterial reality is a lie, is, is not true. It's an illusion, like a self, like consciousness, like beauty, beauty that conveys truth. Is, is beauty just kind of like a pretty thing that like decorates the world, but it doesn't convey anything real? I would argue that no, without beauty, we will die. The beauty is actually fundamental to thought and to life. And I don't, I'm not, I'm more on the literary side, so I'm not going to be able to give a fully philosophical or neurological defense of it. Although I would give a, I think, let me, dive for a second and, th and then I'll let you talk for because I'm talking too much. Neurology, dopamine. I'm not an expert on, on these neurotransmitters, but we have, we don't just think. We think with desire, with direction, with purposes, ends, goals. And you can't think if you don't have desire or purposes or ends or goals. And humans have neurotransmitters like, like dopamine, which is a, a chemical in my brain and in my body that allows me to create, to, to, to motivate myself to overcome a difficult thing and to reach goal, like to, 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 to marry a beloved one or to, to hunt a, a, a creature that I wanted to uh, hunt or, or to, to pursue ice cream when I want ice cream, like, or serotonin, bonds me to another human being. I will die if I don't have bonds to another human being. Um, that's not uh, an extra thing. And that also will enable my proper thinking. And I won't be able to think properly or have reason even. I won't even be able to be reasonable or rational if I don't have serotonin and dopamine and these other neurotransmitters functioning properly. I mean, someone who falls into mental illness uh, is, is, is unable to really think uh, or perceive what's really there. So anyway, I'm trying to dive into uh, neurology for a second, which I'm a little bit out of my, out of my depth, but any, any thoughts on, on neurotransmitters or neurology? Sure. If, if, 
maybe I'll take a step back uh, for for a moment. Uh, earlier on, Paul, you you made a uh, uh, the, the 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 case that um, that 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 the the machinations or that the the sort of the the, the goal behind uh, discussing the concept of determinism is is perhaps by determinists believed to to or or, or in other words determinists uh, are are motivated by by a a need to rectify the the experiential dimension to the will or uh, the intuitions we have about the will um and you know so so, so put simply uh the, the you, know, you you made the case that the we have to rectify or that, that that humanity has to rectify what we can logically say about the will versus our intuition that we have free will however uh so dr sam harris uh, who's a has a, a PhD in in neuroscience from uh, UC, UCLA, uh, and it's important to say neuroscience, not uh, neur neur neurology, because he he has no clinical experience. Um, but but as 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 Dr. Sam Harris would would put it, we we can make a far more uh, damning indictment against uh, against free free will. As as Harris puts it, and I believe this is verbatim his words: uh, the "Free will is an is an illu there there is an an illusion of an illusion of free will." And what he means by that is is that some will will argue in the in the in the uh, uh, de 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 determinist uh, worldview. Those those who hold on to the determinist worldview sometimes will argue that well. They'll, they'll concede that that the the experiential dimension of life would very much lead us to believe that we do have free will. I think it was Charles Dawkins who, in, who inspired uh, Doc, Dr. Uh, Harris, who uh, who actually I, I once heard make, make this comment that we have to somehow recti rectify the fact that it, it feels so compelling that that we have free will versus the fact that we don't have free will. Um, but but as 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 Sam points out, if, if we if we paid close enough attention to the the ex experiential dimension of life, if we paid close enough attention to our thoughts, to our uh, to the activities of our of our minds, we would observe that 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 even the the illusion of free will is non-existent. Because we, we even if, as as Harris puts it, even if tomorrow, um, well, well, even if tomorrow, if if somehow all this this would never happen, well, let's just for the sake of argument say that it would, that we that all of our neuroscience we discover is wrong, that that there is no correlation whatsoever between experience, uh, thoughts, feelings, and and the brain. I mean, and, and let's see, we could even take it even further. Let's say that we 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 know with certainty now that dualism is true, that that that, that there there is a, a that, that, that the part of us that uh, the, the, the stream of consciousness that, that we, we 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 really think of as as self. I mean, e even if that were, were were a real phenomenon, I mean, even if 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 consciousness was divorceable from a uh a a psychophysiology you know, the brain the this you know the, the the body we nonetheless could still observe that we don't we, we even under those conditions we still would not have free will because in in in, in one of the the thought experiments that that's really easy to make this observation is even if we were good ghosts even if we 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 did live in this dualistic world, we we nonetheless would still be able to observe that to be the author of our own thoughts would require that we knew what we were going to think prior to having thought it. Now this is impossible. Thoughts, we, we, if we pay close enough attention to our awareness, thoughts just arise spontaneously. We don't author them into existence. 
And so just as it, it requires, just as free will would require, or, or just as being the author of one's own thoughts would require that he knew what he was going to think prior to having thought it, so too would be would, would being the author of one's own will require that he knew what he was going to will prior to having willed it. So um, I'll, I'll sort of uh, rest my case with that, Paul, and send it over to your Well, way. okay. I'm going to try and quibble with that because I am choosing, you know, this is a silly example, to like put my arm over here. Okay, that's a simple choice and maybe that it doesn't involve a whole lot of free will. But then like we can make bigger choices like what career, who am I going to marry? What career am I going to choose? Um, and, and just because I can't know ahead of time what I'm going to think, I mean, my whole life is in time with a past and a future. And the fact that I'm moving into the future, which is unknown at every, all, at every moment, doesn't mean the future is not there or that, that it was already determined by the past. It seems to me that that argument is a little too cute in the following way. It reminds me, and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase it, but there was this ancient Greek philosopher who said that two points in space will never meet because if you cut it in half, you're, you're there. If you cut it in half again, you're there. If you cut it in half again, if you cut it in half um, an infinite number of times, they will never meet. Therefore, two points in, in space will never meet. Of course, not they'll meet. You just go like this, and then they meet. I mean, it... it it just because you have this cute theoretical framework that seems to say that you can't know what you're going to think. I'm thinking all the time. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always in medias rest. I'm always in the middle of my sentence. A sentence doesn't make sense at any given moment. It has to flow. It's like music. What's music? Does music have any meaning? Music only makes sense. Like there's two notes ding, ding, but, but they're through time. And then you have a melody. Da, 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 da. Then, it, so the meaning of course it's over time, but that doesn't mean it's, I, I think that doesn't convince me. And I, I don't know if I'm giving justice to your, to your statement or just to Sam Harris, Dr. Sarah Harris's statement there, but it, and again, I would even get back to the consciousness thing just because you can't account for consciousness from your already defined premises that the only things that exist are material. Well, of course, that doesn't mean there's no consciousness. I mean, like there, there is the hard problem of consciousness. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there's the statement by philosophers of the hard problem of consciousness. And this is just one aspect of consciousness, but it it is where does the yellowness of yellow exist where does the taste of you know coffee exist or the the taste of feta cheese if it's not like identifiable in some neurological thing that you can measure then it doesn't exist no of course it exists i mean you, just because you can't quantify it doesn't mean that it exists like if otherwise you wouldn't go to like an expensive restaurant to get that feta cheese or to get that, that expensive coffee. I mean, those are real things. I, I, just because you can't quantify them doesn't mean you can't say that they're real, that, that they're illusions. I don't know if I'm giving a, a due to your, your case here, but that's that's what I'm coming up with. Sure. It, 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 so, Harris has his a long has a, has a long form essay called uh, free will in which i get you know which is a bit ironic given that he negates its very existence in it <laughs> but then uh, he he also has a uh he, he also has a has a book called the moral landscape which which you and i have discussed previously on on the podcast mm -hmm. in which he argues that well in, in which he argues that that morality is actually an undeveloped branch of science. Now, there there's a a model uh, that that he invokes, or, an, or really an observation that he, that he invokes from the philosopher of mind, John Searle, that sounds very 
complicated, but 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 is so useful once understood uh, that 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 I mean, just really opens the doors up for for just about I think anyone to 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 truly uh, you know to, to to just unlock such a large portion of the of the philosophical landscape for for I mean anyone a lay person I mean even if you know even if a, a small child uh, a young child learns this model so so per, perhaps if if your viewers could, could bear with me for just a second while I I, I discover the mm. well I will I uh, uh, outline this model because I think it is just so useful the, 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 the there are t the, one unfortunate uh feature of, of the english language and, and perhaps is found in other languages i don't know but one one unfortunate um uh feature of the 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 english language which which makes understanding the world a a, a, a good bit more challenging put Put conservatively, uh, a good bit more ch more challenging is the is the fact that that we use the words subjective and objective in 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 two radically different ways. And if you include the grammatical uses of them, now you're at three radical ways. But let's just stick with two. There's the epistemic use of the words subjective and objective. Uh, which means which which means the the degree to, which which mean, which we, we means that we we use those words objective and, and subjective to express the degree to which we believe an idea is derived dispassionately and free from bias or an observation is derived dispassionately and free from bias if if i owned a 10% stock in in Ben and Jerry's Paul which and I'm not in finance, but I believe that would just be I'm not in finance yet, and and I but I believe that would just be a huge I mean that would be a huge portion of, of Ben and Jerry's, and I said to you, uh, Paul, I, I can say objectively that Cherry Garcia is the best ice cream. You would say to me, well, Sean, no, you can't say that objectively because you own a ten percent stock in Ben and Jerry's, and every time somebody uh, bites into a uh, or, or a, a cone of of cherry Garcia. You're getting that much. Uh, you know, you're pocketing that much more uh, shackle, as it were. Uh, so, so that would be. I would. I wouldn't be objective in the epistemic sense. It'd be a lie if I were to say that I was. But then there's the ontological use of the words subject and object. Uh, which means, which which means the which is really just the humanities, um, or 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 you know those who speak English, our way of distinguishing between the animate and the inanimate. Um, if if you if you took a if 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 right now, Paul, you you took your your uh, your Mac and 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 you went outside and and all of our viewers saw you pick up a rock. And throw it at a tree, and if that rock broke into you know a bunch of different pieces, we might we we might be think it was odd. We might think it was you know we might be concerned about Paul. Why is he doing that? We might think, um, you know, we we, we might think uh, we, we might just think that that's awfully bizarre. But but nobody could truly describe your relationship to the rock as having been transgressive. You didn't abuse the rock. Um, uh, Paul, because rocks can't be abused because they don't. There's not an experiential dimension to their being. But if you were to, or uh, I mean, if, if anybody were to do this, if anybody were to take a, a you know a small dog and throw you know throw a dog against the tree, or a, even a, you know even if it was a squirrel against the tree, or I mean I mean even if you had the most callous of hunters, I think they would still be able to recognize that that causing unnecessary uh, distress and harm to an you know to an animal is. Yeah, you know, it, it isn't quite the you know uh, the proper way to conduct oneself. But but if you did do that, we every anyone would be on very firm ground in defining your relationship to that animal as having been transgressive or as having been abusive. And so, why do I bring this up? What is what is the the the, the big uh, you know what what is the big revelation here that that is to be made? Well, it is this. Uh, we can make epistemically objective 
meaning dispassionately derived and free from bias observations about another's ontological subjectivity, which is to say experience in life. So with, with you know, the, I, I think you're, you're pointing out something that, that is, you, you have pointed out something that, that, that Dr. Sam Harris is very concerned about, especially as, as it relates to morality, which is that, that, that there is this confusion, there's, there's this big misbelief that we can only make objective observations about objects in the world or about physical phenomenology. I know that, you know, photons, I don't believe have mass, but, but you know, that's sort of, you know, that, that, that we can make uh, uh, objective claims only about those types of phenomena, you know, phenomena, that, that kind of phenomena. And that uh, sadness, happiness, um, well-being, suffering, that these are, you know, that some believe that, that, that these, we can't, we can't quite uh, say are, are scientific uh, matters of scientific investigation. And uh, I think you're, you're onto something that is foolish. Of course, there is, uh, an, an, uh, I guess we could say an immaterial world or, or we could say that there are ontological, um, ontologically subjective phenomena, which is to say that they only exist. It's not to say, it's not to, to say that they don't have a course corresponding brain state but it is to say that that we can talk about that phenomenon in so far as it exists as a matter of experience when whatever the relationship that happiness has whatever whatever brain states are quote you know quote unquote happy um uh, that we, we 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 can postulate very compellingly from our observation that someone bumps their head they go blind someone bumps their head a different way they forget their name that that the happiness does have a brain state, but we nonetheless can talk about that phenomena as it exists solely as a as an experience. And so, um, uh, and I, I think once we make that observation, um, we can say that 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 there is both a material and immaterial world, but that we don't have to invoke the concept the the, the uh, Abrahamic concept of of there being a, a one you know the the sole uh creator deity the the prime mover as i think the greeks would put it we don't have to say that we have souls we don't have to say that that uh, we don't have to subscribe to dualism or you know we don't we don't have to say that that will will, will go on when we die to know that there is a material and, and as you put it immaterial universe so i i, I you know that that was sort of a mouthful um yeah and and if you bring it up at you know Thanksgiving dinner, a lot of people will roll their eyes. I, I, <laughs> I should know. I've got firsthand experience with that. But I think once understood, I mean, the whole conversation of philosophy just the doors just open right up for anybody. I think even lay people. Um, I, so I I don't know. Well, I think thank you for offering that, and I'm going to look deeper into this distinction that, that that you're getting from Searle, I guess, between the epistemological and the ontological. Um I I don't I'm not going to go in that direction directly because I just don't know as much about it about that. But I guess let me follow up a question because you were pointing out that things like sadness and suffering, and I guess you would consider the taste of fetid cheese or coffee, are these subjective things which uh if we just get a little more science will be able to identify in the brain where that takes place. And, and it's a material thing. There's nothing immaterial there at all. Um, and then what about, let me, let me just, th just throw out another thing. Um, beauty. And I just think about it because I think I think about art. And one of the things that I'm seeing a lack of in the Sam Harris account is any concern with art, and 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 maybe he's just not interested in it. But it seems to me that is a big gap in any account of human knowledge and human phenomenology. Um, and 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 is it just the case that it doesn't matter to him at all? I well, I'll I'll offer this, Paul. I'm, you know, it's it's pretty brief, and and I think it'll it'll answer your question, although somewhat indirectly. 
uh, as Sam would, would put it, we, we, we need not make any uh, grandiose or, or unfounded claims about the nature or origins of love. We, we need not say that it existed for the Big Bang or that we'll have it when we after we die or you know, we, we need not make any of these claims about the nature of love to know that it is the most that it, 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 it is one of the most important phenomena in the whole world, if not the most important phenomena that 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 we know of, and that that that, and we could even go so far as to, and I don't know if the Harris makes this claim, but we could even go so far as to say, you know, no matter how much we we if we when we become a multiplanetary species, when we go out into the world, no phenomena that we ever encounter could could we imaginable or or, or unimaginable could even compete with with love. Um, you know, because I mean, for for you know, for, for a whole bunch of reasons, but but we need not make any of those grandiose claims to know that love is 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 this is, is such an important phenomena. And I'll 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 end it with um, as Harris puts it, acad the the defender of love is academic honesty, which that was funny the way he put it. I mean, I think really what he meant was honesty, but but I was one time listening to him and he put it as academic honesty, um. But 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 I I, hope, I don't know if that answers your question, Paul. But I'll I'll leave that to you. That's that's helpful. I mean, yeah, I think, and and I think let's think about love. Let's think about beauty as kind of similar things. Love is is more like the relational thing between like parent and child, or two lovers, or friends. And I yeah, I think that's a crucial thing. And I'm glad. And I'll have to look at what he exactly says about that. But it sounds like you're saying he's saying you can't say anything about it because it, you can't get to it from a brain neuron, neuron or or a series of synapses. Is that the case? Well, or is I, he saying I, that it, it is reducible to that? It, uh, the whether or not it does, whether or not love has a psychophysiological signature, or even if tomorrow we discover the brain has nothing to do with it, it doesn't change the 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 care. It doesn't change the experiential dimension of of love. I mean, I think as he put it, I thought it was was quite uh, funny, and this is a little bit of a cheeky joke that he once made. You know, uh, Sam Harris has two daughters, and um, he he you know he one time said uh, he was one time being interviewed and. And he was at, you know, he was talking about his his children, and and he said, um, he he was a bit confused by the question, and he said, I think the view, the interviewer, I think he said something like, "Are are you asking me if when I'm with my my child, if I think to myself, oh, uh, you know, oh wow, uh, all these neurotransmitters are giving rise to all of this cuteness." Uh, uh, no, I mean the the experiential dimension of life is what is important, um, and and in in the absence of it. There really is nothing to uh, to about which to to care. Um, so I mean, whether whether or not it does have a psychophysiological signature or doesn't, the the experiential dimension of love remains intact and will 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 uh, for the foreseeable future continue to remain intact. Uh, so it almost seems like you're trying to express a uh, an issue with. Um, well, I guess there are some who will, you know, if if they're if they're, you know, I mean, let's say there's an atheist parent and the son or the son or daughter comes to the the parent and they're they're in high school and says, you know, I really got my heart broken by by one of my fellow classmates, you know, I had a crush on or something. Um, but, you know, it, it, it almost sounds like what you're intuiting is is it would be reasonable for that parent to say, well, well, that's um that's you know, it's it's not it's not really a concern because it's not real because you're your sadness or your your uh, affection for them was just a bunch of chemicals in your brain and i i don't think anybody who's reasonable would would really make that argument and but i think perhaps you're right though paul perhaps there is a subset perhaps there's even a large subset or or even let's even say the majority of atheists who think that that's a reasonable argument um but but sam harris certainly wouldn't be in that bucket uh, i i wouldn't be in that bucket good that's helpful and i appreciate that and and I have some thoughts on that, which is, well, here's a couple of thoughts. One is, I think we're agreeing with a lot. We're agreeing on a lot here. Um, but I was listening to this debate and it was on love. 
and this one philosopher woman was arguing with these other philosophers, or actually they were artists. And this is an interesting thing to think about the difference between how different disciplines approach knowledge, objective and subjective reality, and love. And again, I think I'm arguing for the importance of the arts, uh, literature. These are not just like decorations, which are kind of, we can get rid of them and still not lose anything in terms of our knowledge of the world. But this woman was arguing, I think she was kind of a materialist. She was kind of saying, there's really no difference between love and lust, that it's the same, like just physical sexual desire is just the same thing. Um, and we we give a name of love to it to make it feel better. So it's not like just this pure selfish uh, acquisition of pleasure. But that that's a lie. That she she was kind of saying like that we basically lie to ourselves when we talk about love. And then the the logically the the other debaters are saying that's uh, that's terrible. How can you say that? I mean, there's nothing more real than love. I mean, like that's what. And so, uh, and and I, I'm sure Sam Harris knows that, and then and, and as do you. So I'm, I'm. But I guess does does he or do you have? Because you were saying a minute ago that he says that morality is just undeveloped science. Like once we get more science of the brain and neurology, we'll just realize that morality is just a science. Like any kind of like metaphysical thoughts about the good and evil are superfluous. It's really just about brains and neurons. Do you think the same thing is the case with love? Well, I, I think it, it, Harris would argue that the that that the it's not actually our 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 brain states. It's not actually our our neuroscience, which which uh, Harris has a, has a brilliant thought experiment that I think will will sort of address this. If if tomorrow there's a, a study where there's, um, and I'm 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 changing it up a little bit from I'm probably deviating from how he put it. But if tomorrow, uh, I mean, let's say let's let's take his alma mater. Let's take UCLA tomorrow. If they had a, a, they came out with a study that showed that um, out of a hundred participants, those who were injected with, um, with, uh, I mean, I, I think let's, let's say neuroepinephrine, uh, uh, adrenaline, uh, the, the, those that were were injected, only sixty, only um, forty percent, or only sixty percent, indicated that that there was an experiential dimension of of uh of of feeling a bit more energized of having a you know you know a, a racing heart of of, of being uh, more awake of, of being energized well then um or you know or let's even let's even go more radical let's even say it's only one person only one person who, who has that well now, now our our utility for 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 epinephrine or, or our understanding of what it does has just changed and and so you you can we can never we can never actually get rid of the 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 experiential dimension of this because that's that's that is where the the meaning is found i mean that's what there is to care about if 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 we lived in a world where and i don't mean to be be sort of uh crude with this but i think it's the poet um uh i forget what his name was uh, uh i think it was charles Bowski or something, um, who was a poet. It, it, even if tomorrow we learned that sort of um, uh, uh, that that, um, or I'll, I'll, you know, I'll actually put it this way: even if tomorrow we we discovered that um, damaging the brain didn't, if if, if damaging the brain uh, or or destroying the brain didn't lead to a cessation of consciousness, well, then we couldn't quite say that shooting somebody is murder anymore, could we? And that is really, I mean, that that is truly what is abhorrent about about uh, sh shooting somebody is that that is that you're you're harming what 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 there is to harm, which is subjectivity. Uh, I mean, if, if our if we if we could really you know disembody ourselves and go get another body at the the nearest uh, uh, you know birthing ward, and this is getting really this will sound so bizarre. You should put this on the highlight reel. Um, mm -hmm. all, all of a sudden, assaulting somebody wouldn't be such an awful crime. Um, 
so it it um so i mean whether or not whether you know now all of our all, you know all, any reasonable person would would take a look at the uh, you know as, as harris would, would probably argue any reasonable person who who would take a look at the the literature uh would 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 know that there's just overwhelming reason to believe that that the mind is is the um the, the, the mind at the very least corresponds with a particular state of psychophysiology so, in, so much so that we can postulate reasonably that in the future we uh, even if we can't discover what physiological states give rise to every uh, conceivable state of mind that every state of mind does have a particular brain state that if you were to swap with me somehow paul adam for adam well you'd be me i mean i mean even if that happened even if that happened five minutes ago you and i wouldn't know any of the, the better because it's not as if there's a part of us which is subpart from our anatomy so i i don't necessarily know if this material immaterial argument holds any water but i would say that that your criticism of that worldview is much is, is very much what what Harris Harris also criticizes, um, and maybe that's even why he calls morality an undeveloped science. I mean, that, you know, perhaps the secular world is going to have to concede we can make objective observations about somebody's subjectivity, and uh, th this is the basis for a a, a, moral, a science of morality. It's also, um, yeah. So I I throw that at you. Sure, that's that's very helpful, and so I I really liked how. We are finding some common ground here, uh, your position and Sam Harris's position and my own, on the importance of things like love and beauty and and um, and the essential connection between brain, our physical brain and our mind states or our, our consciousness states. Uh, I I totally agree. Like, so I think we're we're finding some common ground. I think we're we're starting to get closer to a good dis description of our distinctions, our differences. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to move to close, but, um, but I think this was super helpful to me and I hope, hope helpful to you to, to kind of get closer to, to, to pinpointing exactly what the distinctions that we're making between these two, two viewpoints are. Um, you pointed out like, um, that uh, I, I liked your, your sort of thought experiment about like if there was a study tomorrow and, and you inject people with with um, adrenaline and how they people experience things like yeah clearly things like adrenaline and serotonin and um, other neurotransmitters are crucial to how we know and experience the world and so that is determined and and so. Um, and I think one of the things, if we can talk again, I would like to address is, let's say, even addictions, because these things are related to addictions. In fact, someone made the, the, the point that there's actually a very similar, there's a big similarity between being addicted to a drug and falling in love in terms of the brain, how the brain functions and how yeah. the, the neurotransmitters right. are working. And I think that could be a really useful way uh, of, of going further into the concept of love and its and, rela and its relation to the brain because there is a, there is a definitely a relation. Um, so so let's let's talk more and hopefully we can we can do another discussion I think on this and on similar topics. But but I think we did a lot today and I really appreciate that. Um, do you have any 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 other last quick thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I, well, yeah, I appreciate the conversation, Paul. I, I, we did get through uh, quite a bit. And just um, just for, for sort of the, the viewers, I think that the the research you might be quoting from is, is by a woman named Dr. Helen Fisher. I think she's from, uh, um, well, she, she, she wrote the book, uh, The Anatomy of Love. Um, and I, I believe she's sort of uh, known for, for pioneering the, the research into the neuroscience of love. Um, she was also the she also is the chief science consultant for Match.com. So if the viewers, I think, want to check out a little bit more of that literature, um, it's it's Helen Fisher, who's uh, who's fun. Um, but no, I appreciate being on, Paul. I think that the the, uh, the, the, the there's uh, uh, the, the, there's more to be continued on this. Excellent, excellent. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look her up. Yes, 
I think that is the person that that um, that I heard in that discussion. So I'm going to go. I'm going to look up that book. That sounds like an important book. Uh, but thank you very much. And so let's let's sign off, and we'll pick it up again next time. Thank you, Paul. Take care.